Welcome to the very first episode in Emotional Fitness at Home. I'm Cynthia Morton, uh, thanks for joining me. If you haven't heard anything about my work before, Emotional Fitness is not a clinical model. It's a lived experience model and I have been sharing tips, tricks, traps, techniques, all around emotional health and well-being that I've collected over the last 25 years of my recovery. So I'm a recovering drug addict alcoholic. I've been clean and sober one day at a time, consistently abstinent from drugs and alcohol since October the 12th, 1995. And whilst I have done a lot of work on cognition over the years you know, in my own life, so CBT, EMDR, and these are forms of retraining the brain, also uh, love the art of mindfulness, which we hear a lot about, which is very much around observing thoughts and retraining thoughts. But the model of work that I call emotional fitness is very much around what I like to call heartfulness. Because I find there are many people, you know, some of my clients are clinicians themselves, some are elite athletes, yoga teachers, uh, personal trainers, and they find that they're very good with thought and they, they you know, they can, they can um, monitor thoughts and behaviors, but they have trouble implementing and maintaining change in behavior. Now, often this is because their heart's battery is flat. How do you recharge your heart's battery? Well, you've got to go within. So with mindfulness, we can look at the intellect and we can look at thoughts and those processes. And that's very much what I like to call our masculine, our intellect, our sexual self, our physical self, our external self, is our kingdom. It's what we build our kingdom with. And we all need um, to have a very strong relationship with our masculine because we all have to stand up, speak up, provide and protect, procreate, um, carry ourselves in the world with pride. And we're gonna unpack that word in a moment because it's a tricky one. But our queendom, our internal world, what happens when we come home, when we, um, connect to those in our home. Now, I've spent quite a few years being a single uh, woman. I'm a mother, my boys are 33 and 31 now. But when I first got clean and sober, the marriage I had to their dad broke down. And so there were times where the boys were at their dad's and I would come home to an empty house. And it was in those, you know, the dark night of the soul when I was rebooting my life and uh, renovating my relationship with my feminine self. I had to go within and for all of us, regardless of your gender, uh, your relationship with your queendom, which is your internal world, your emotional body, with what fires up your heart, that is something that needs equal attention. And there are many people that practice, they go and they have a lot of clinical therapy, they do a lot of mindfulness, but they don't have a practice where they reboot the heart. So. If we look at our ego or our, or our um, external self being at one device, perhaps your iPad, they start their day with that device on 100% battery. But if their heart is perhaps the secondary device like a mobile phone, that's only on 6 to 10% battery. And what happens is they don't, they just top it up. You know, they have a good sleep and they, they, you know, we all have rituals where we sort of reboot the heart. It might be going for a walk. It might be um, any kind of meditative practice, and meditation simply means connecting, listening, and rebooting your, in, your relationship with your inner world. But they, that is not a robust enough practice. So they start their day on a 10% battery, their queendoms fired up 10%, their kingdoms fired up 90 to 100%. And so what happens is they do a lot in the day, and they're good at, they're successful at doing, but when it comes to having, sitting with a big feeling, if they get jealous, if they get angry, if they get sad, vulnerable, disappointed, frustrated, betrayed, any big feeling, they drop out of range. Or they go into panic or anxiety because they're low on battery. It's like being low on fuel in a car journey. It's very hard to relax if you're going from, especially if you live in Australia, one country town to another, and the fuel gauge is on red. 
you are just spending your whole day your whole journey vigilant looking for the next petrol station hoping the hell you don't conk out and for those that don't know how to articulate how to emotionally um, look after their fitness which is keeping that heart battery on 90 to 100 percent every day they spend their life anxious during the day hoping nobody emotionally drains them and staying away from people that are emotionally demanding disconnecting and many people do that when they come home because they've only got very little fuel and you hear people saying a lot I haven't got it in the tank I just haven't got it to give and many people that complain a lot about being tired some of that is physical tiredness but sometimes a component of it is loneliness and you know lonely because they're disconnected from their own heart and they're not feeling much they don't even know how they feel because that they keep dropping in and out of range so let's get to our topic of pride when we look at the seven deadly sins and again I'm not religious I'm not here to sell anything I'm just here to share some uh, information I've learned over the years and I absolutely defend your right to disagree with me you know but certainly you know emotional fitness is, is about self-evaluation it's about going within it's about checking in what does this word mean for me now with with all of the seven deadly sins pride you know envy sloth wrath as we go through them all they're often you know sin is a fairly negative word but I love the first time I heard somebody explain to me and it was a beautiful nun I met her in a recovery meeting I think I was about 10 days clean and sober her name was sister Anne and anyone that's been in recovery in Brisbane for over 20 years will may well have come across sister Anne anyway I used to sit next to her uh, I love there's a show called call the midwives and there's you know there's a woman on that uh, that reminds me of sister Anne just this lovely woman with these innocent wide eyes who was so kind to me you know and in those days when I first got clean and sober I looked like a hooker but I felt like a nun I looked like you know anyway uh, because you know I was sexualized before really I was I learned to verbalize and I was taught that 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 was an energy I was skilled at using and I used to try and you know my sexuality walked into the room before my femininity or my humanity did and that's you know it's a bit like a Russian gymnast that is taught how to do gymnastics when they're pre-verbal when they walk into a room later in life you can see their athleticism walks into the room before they do because it's been overworked again it's not good or bad it's just it is what it is so sister Anne I remember you know sitting next to her and um, she explained so much to me and being a religious woman but also an alcoholic nun I mean she used to drink you know the sherry she you know she was a piss pot she was she was in recovery and just this amazing kaleidoscope of contradictions now she said to me the word sin uh, was was a word that came from the days of the Crusades when they you know the soldiers were practicing archery and they put a a um, you know like a target a bullseye on a tree and all the archers would practice you know trying to obviously get the arrow to go into the bullseye like you could try and get a dart to go into a dartboard's bullseye now she says to me it's a Latin word which basically means anytime the archers miss the mark they would call they would all yell out sin which means to miss the mark and I find it really interesting you know when we use that word and she also used 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 to say to me it's a phrase you've probably heard it's beautiful every saint has a past and every sinner has a future and as we unpack the seven deadly sins we're just going to have a look because they're a beautiful model of talking about these internal areas where people get blocked there are very few of us on the planet that won't admit to getting blocked in any of those seven deadly sins now interestingly so I like to just look at patterns and links and I meditate every morning I meditate on the chakras every morning I have been doing so for 25 years and I love the colored chakras and I'm going to show you some links it's not that the seven deadly sins to the chakras and then also two to the seven stages of grief because again this is, these are all languages that help give us stories or explanations or colors to learn our emotional lessons because our internal world's invisible but you know we sure as hell feel it we feel thunder in our groin in our heart in our gut in our throat in our head 
we feel energy build there. You know, we, we sort of talk about having a pain in the neck or, you know, people are a pain in the ass or, you know, uh, some people give you a headache. You know, sometimes, you know, some people's energy makes us feel sick. We feel it in our gut. These are all, uh, you know, the, the body keeps score. The body is a beautiful servant designed to listen to the head and the heart, your logic and your emotion, and then work with the instruction. And if your head and your heart are giving your body mixed signals, the body gets blocked. It gets confused and it says, hang on a minute, you know, can we just pump the brakes? You need to have a look at and get some clarity on getting sign off from your emotions and your thought because so many people allow their masculine to dominate their feminine. They put logic above emotion. And that's a form of domestic violence with your own internal world where you, 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 know, you ridicule any emotion you have, calling it pathetic, weak, ridiculous, insane, whatever, because you're having a big feeling. Now, if you don't know how to sit with a big feeling and you're emotionally unfit, we can, you know, we can feel incompetent and, and inadequate, so we just make feelings wrong. The great news is, coming from somebody who has been incredibly unfit and has still got a long way to go, with regular exercise on articulation, like with regular exercise with a personal trainer at a gym, with repetition, daily repetition, anybody can build muscle mass. Anybody can have arms like Madonna and an ass like Beyonce and you know uh, a six pack like Arnie. Anybody can if you want to do the homework. If you want to do the work. So Sister Anne explaining what sins were, and then you know if we, if we have a look at pride, and I'm going to link today pride within the seven deadly sins. I'm going to link that with the chakras where we connect the crown chakra and also the first stage in the grieving process, which is denial. Because in the years, the 25 years that I've been working my own recovery and sitting in a very um, privileged, a beautiful position, it's an honor to sit with people that, you know, many of my clients have trauma and addiction, but many of them uh, get emotionally stuck. Most of my clients don't have mental health issues, but they have emotional fitness issues. So um, if we work on our emotional fitness, we can intercept or help heal components of mental health. Um, it's a bit like, you know, if you keep good physical health, you can intercept some serious health problems or minimize them. Okay, so pride. That's the first in the seven deadly sins. And you've probably heard the saying, you know, uh, they'll cut off their nose despite their face or pride cometh before the fall. Now, you'll probably hear me say this a few times, you teach what you need to learn. I got some really serious pride homework just recently. Um, and pride cometh before the fall absolutely fits here. I had been overworking my masculine, which is my default setting. My masculine, I learned at an early age in my family of origin that feminine, the feminine, um, which is feelings and emotion, didn't get much credibility. And in my family of origin, you know, I had a violent um, male in my, well, two violent males in my uh, family of origin. And I just learned as a little girl and as a young woman and as a teenager, masculinity dominates. It's more powerful. It wins. It always wins. It always wins. And femininity is okay if you're sexual. That's the only kind of street cred you get. It's the only value you've got in your femininity because any, any of your feelings are a burden and your sensitivity is a problem. And that, that was just what I decided in my own little head. So I grew up as a teenager. I discovered drugs and alcohol and I discovered if I remained emotionally disconnected, I could use my sexuality as a weapon. And I did. I punished and seduced males for many years and I, um, because I wanted to be in control. And the moment a male got sentimental with me, you know, and wanted to buy me flowers or have a relationship, I would dump him and think, oh, for God's sake, man up. He's weak. What's wrong with him? And I remember, you know, working with a therapist and, and um, saying to him, you know, oh, I don't know what's wrong with this, this guy. You know, I pushed him and prodded him and, you know, I actually even hit him. And I used to, I used to be 
you know, take out a lot of my frustrations pushing and prodding men. And I would always ch choose big gladiatorial men. And this one man in particular that didn't hit me back, I remember saying to my therapist, I think he's a bit soft. I think he's a bit weak. And my therapist said, no, Cynthia, this man respects you. This is what respect looks like. You know, he walked away. Uh, and he came back and told you that he loved you. That's, that takes strength. God, it was a foreign concept for me at that time. Anyway... Pride cometh before the fall. My default setting, I'm not a slow learner. Most of us adults aren't slow learners, but we're quick forgetters when it comes to emotional fitness because we can't always see that. And one thing I have learned is the older I get, the assignments just keep coming. You know when I have people say to me, oh, when does this emotional fitness work stop? Because I'm, I'm fucking over it. It's, you know, when do the lessons stop? And I say to them, well, you know, it depends what quality of life you want. When does physical fitness stop? You know, when does... Physical hygiene stop. It doesn't. You know, you don't wake up one day, uh, you know, at age 15 going, well, I am so over cleaning my teeth. I've done it for 50 years. It should be enough by now. Well, you can stop cleaning your teeth. You'll have dog breath. But, you know, you can stop being physically fit at whatever age you like. And many people throw the towel in. But, you know, you, there will be consequences to that. If you want quality of life, you need to look after your, your um, intellectual health, your physical health, your sexual health, your financial health and your emotional health. So the assignments just keep coming. And the more I've come to learn, the older I get, the less I know. And the assignments keep coming. But I get arrogant. I get prideful. I get stuck thinking that I'm running the show. So I normally have January off. You know, I normally have five months off over Christmas. Uh, five weeks off, sorry. And my husband does as well. And this year we had a staycation. We stayed at home. We tinkered in the garden. We built our herb garden. We just had a lovely, lovely time. We've got a beautiful swimming pool. I think I spent the last couple of weeks just in togs and a sarong. It was divine. And I relaxed. I rested. I repaired. I practiced what I preach. First week back, my, my uh, diary was very, very full. So I took on more clients than normal. Now, during my five weeks off, I like to run. I run every morning and I had been, you know, I've been running, you know, but I'd also been then having the whole day to recuperate. And, and I had been running consistently and I, you know, I'm a little documenter. I document everything and I study patterns in myself. And I like the whole model of, you know, rebooting uh, new behaviors in 90 days. And I wanted to practice running a minimum of six Ks every morning for, 90 days and I was up to day 80 you know I'm, I'm 58 this year my hip was getting sore and I'd done a run the you know during the holidays with my uh, my son who's you know 33 and runs marathons and is a hell of a lot fitter with, than me and saying I went for a run for him is even a bit arrogant because um he's six foot eight he's tall and so he you know he was very kind and he would say mum let's just go at your pace but after I'd warmed up I'd say okay sweetheart you know let's you set the pace now I want to see you know if I can run at your pace and my god I was sprinting I could only do it for a couple of minutes and we stopped what well, we didn't stop we slowed down but he even said to me mum you know really do you think running 80 running 90 days every day is a is a really good thing you know even elite athletes they cross train they stop are you having any rest days now me knowing it all um, I had decided that, you know, because I was doing 6K every morning quite easily, um, some mornings 10K, but a minimum of six. And I, you know, I said to him, well, it's, you know, you don't say to anybody that's walking every morning, you should have a rest. It's not, I'm not overextending myself. And he just said, look, just saying, mum, he was very sweetly, but you know, my pride, I knew everything, you know, I, you know, I just ignored him. Um, so that was happening during the holidays. But as I said, I would have this big run, then I could have a snooze, go for a swim, la la la. First week back at work, I'm, you know, I think it was, it was the, um, you know, I'm running every morning and getting up and doing back to back clients and not coming upstairs until eight o'clock at night, sometimes starting, you know, very early, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. But I had to get up at four to go for a run. So I'm just, I hit the ground running literally my first week back at work. And then on that, I start noticing I'm getting sore in the hip. And so I decide, you know, maybe, maybe I should have a morning off. Maybe it would be a good idea because my body's starting to say, hang on a minute, could you slow it down? And I'm you know, thinking, okay, listen. So on that morning, I get up, it's been raining. I've got my slippers on. I've got a beautiful mandevilla vine that climbs up my two-story home. And I have a very intimate relationship with that. And I twirl it and make sure it's... It's a bit like styling its hair in the morning. I twirl it and make sure it's all doing well. And I was climbing in my slippers and pyjamas 
after a rainy morning and I just got carried away and I climbed too high and I lost my footing and I fell and I came down and crushed my ankle. And I cried like a little five-year-old girl. It hurt, I saw this white flash. My husband came running down anyway. Long story short, in a very prideful state, because it was very inconvenient, I, you know, I wanted to run again, but my ankle blew up. But we put ice packs on it, we elevated it. And I could walk on it, it was tender, but myself, my husband and Dr. Google, we all decided it was just a sprain. Long story short, five weeks passed, the leg's still blown up. Maybe, you know, in my arrogance and my pridefulness, because it didn't suit me. It didn't suit me to get information that didn't align with my script. And that's what pride is. We become closed-minded. We, we, we become know-it-alls. We don't want to see anything that contradicts our script. We know everything. We are, you know, we've disappeared up our own ass. We're unteachable. You know, we don't want to take, you know, my son was trying to give me a gentle hint, you know, and I wasn't listening. My right ankle, which, you know, your right side of your body is where all the masculine, you know, the left-hand side of the brain, which is the creative brain, looks after the right-hand side of the, bo the, bro the body. And, you know, um, my understanding in my world is that, you know, my feminine was trying to talk to my body and saying, will you slow the fuck down, woman? And if you will not slow down, I'm pulling rank. And my body, you know, I my, my right ankle was not going to heal. I was not getting the message. I was not doing my pride homework. So I ended up going to a physio, being in a moon boot. And, you know, I have had to rest and repair and slow down. Now, I was in denial as well. And denial is, you know, the first stage in the grieving process. And a lot of people get very, again arrogant and aggressive and judgmental of people in denial. Now, this work that we're gonna do in this series is about taking all of the judgment and the shame out of pride, denial and disconnection. Because when we are prideful and we all get stuck there, and when we are blinkered, shaming us more doesn't help. And sometimes we're not ready to hear it like I wasn't ready to hear my son. You know, I was blinkered and prideful. I was being a pain in the ass and I was closed to that. And, you know, um, uh, Brene Brown, I love her. If you don't know her, Google her. My God, she's, you know, I've got a bit of a crush on Brene Brown. Part of me wants to be like her when I grow up, but she's four years younger than me, so I think I've missed that boat. But anyway, she also talks about a stage when she was um, putting a book out and she had a huge to-do list and she, I think she hits her head or something and she gets concussion. And, you know, she talked about a very similar thing. It just didn't suit, you know, but Mother Nature dropped her ass and said, woman, look after yourself, basically. So the body will pull rank if the masculine is not listening to what the feminine is trying to say. And I got this, you know, so how is this useful to you? I would like you to have a think about where your pride blocks you and where you get into denial. Now, when we're in denial too, we don't know we're in it. For any of you watching maths, I've had a lot of my clients, you know, um, whether you like reality television or not, you know, they're often, often interesting studies, you know, whether it's scripted or not, we, you know, we get to see some dysfunctional human behavior that we can, many of us can relate to. And I've had some clients recently after this last series of maths going, oh my God, have you seen that woman? She's in so much denial. She's such a liar. She's, you know, and, and this real self-righteous judgment. Now, people lie because they're too scared to tell their truth. Why are they too scared to tell their truth? Because it's, you know, there's somewhere in their past. They have been taught it's not safe. If you tell somebody the truth, it's like a, you know, giving them a stick to hit, hit you with. You stay in denial. I grew up in a home, you know, that, you know, I remember one incident where uh, a female in my home had a bone broken by the aggressor in our home. And as a little, as a little girl, I was taught the script to say if anybody asked how this, this female had broken her bone. Now, many, many of us are brought up in homes where denial is the script. You know, we keep up appearances, we don't tell family secrets and we we make up stories to deny the truth. So we get taught to deny our truth and believe and live in the lie. 
And when you're marinated in that, it's a default setting that you move into. And you know, I love the acronym, I love words, you know, the acronym for denial, D-E-N-I-A-L, didn't even know it's a lie. Obviously the N was spelling no, K-N-O-W with N-O-W, with N-O, sorry. Didn't even know it's a lie. When people are in denial, they don't always know they're there. Now, I can beat myself up and say, hey, Miss Emotional Fitness, you know, your son was trying to, you were in denial about the fact that you needed to give yourself a break. And I was, I was blinkered, I wasn't interested in it taking in, I was in my head, I was blocked. I wasn't listening to my heart. I wasn't looking after myself. I was being robotic, I was on automatic pilot. I just wanted, you know, that Nike saying, just do it. I just wanted to get that 90 days done. My body just had to align because my masculine, just do it, get this shit done, was ruling. Wasn't listening to my body, wasn't listening to my heart that was saying, could we sleep in this morning? You are tired. You know, you need to rest, it's too much. You're burning the candle at both ends. I didn't want to hear that, it was inconvenient. So when we are lying, you know, and we all lie, by the way, the most biggest lie, the biggest lie, the most common lie most adults tell is, you know, you say, how are you? And they go, yeah, I'm fine. And they're not, they're not fine. They're struggling, they're just holding on, they're fragile, they're overwhelmed, whatever they are, they're stuck. So denial is the first stage of the grieving process. I just remember footage of 9-11 where, and look, you know, COVID's no different. Haven't we all been in a bit of denial when this first started happening overseas? That, you know, it would ever happen here, that it was real? It was very hard because, it, you know, you go into shock and it's like you minimise, we all do. When I saw the first lot of footage from 9-11, I remember seeing people walking around New York City with ash all over them like they were zombies. I mean, these people were in shock, they were in denial. They, they had, it was too much trauma to take in. And when people are, have a history of trauma or they've got a, a wound of trauma, whether it's, it happened last year, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that bullet wound to the heart is there. Now they have to have, denial is a tourniquet to that wound. If you haven't got elders around you that are emotionally literate or a healer around you, you are going to have to go into denial and minimize that wound. You're gonna to have to soldier on. And so people often become liars because they have taught, been taught that denial is the way to go. Keep your blinkers on, do not look down, do not look at that wound, pretend it's not happening. You know, you've got to soldier on, suck it up, build a bridge, drink a cup of concrete, you've heard it all. And so many people in denial don't know they're lying. Now, when you're looking at somebody in denial, you can go, how can they not know? That happened, they are bullshitting. When people are in fight or flight, they will, many of them will hold to the death. You know, I know when I first came out and started to talk about the predatory men in my life, I had been brought up in an environment of denial and many people that were around those predators will still call me a liar. They will still say it didn't happen. It didn't happen, we didn't see it happening. Now, how many, whether it's Michael Jackson or Rolf Harris or the Hey Dad stars or the Harvey Weinsteins, what's the common theme? They're all called liars. Why? Because everybody, for dysfunctional behavior to continue, the perpetrator of the behavior needs to be surrounded by enablers that deny it. And, you know, I, I had been taught to deny and pretend that we had happy families. Now, so whenever you see somebody who is blatantly in denial, like this woman on maths, maths that a lot of people have been talking about, she deserves compassion, not shame. The woman's stuck and she's, you know, and, and, um, a lot of people are sort of saying, my God. And, you know, again, there was a woman who was in the previous maths and in every series, they seem to select the archetypes, who was also shut off from her femininity, which was, she was in her masculine. She was defending the males. She was not connected to the sisterhood, her womanhood, her own femininity. It was all about her sexual behavior, protect the males, protect the masculine, because that's the only dance she knows. And if I don't do that dance, I'm not safe. And I, you know, I was taught to protect the predator, to protect, it's just a, you know, it's a, um, 
it's, it's really deep programming. Now, when we see a woman go into shock or go into this disassociative state where they don't cry, you know, I remember seeing Lindy Chamberlain after, you know, Azaria Chamberlain, you know, who, she the woman was disassociated. Now, when people disassociate, if you don't know what you're seeing, you may be calling that person just a hard-faced, bald-faced, bare-faced liar. But they've disconnected. They've, the heart plug is out. They cannot feel a thing. They have got their armor on. They are at battle. And they will hold true to their lie because it ain't safe to take your armor off. And they come across as prideful and disconnected. And it, it's not attractive behavior. But, you know, let's be honest, when we have been prideful, when you and I have been prideful, and God knows I have and I will be again, I have been so grateful for the men and women in my life that have loved me through that. You've heard that beautiful saying, if you can't love me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. Now, any parent that's got kids that are, you know, <sighs> you walk into the room and they've got chocolate all over their face, and there's red crayon all over the wall and they've got the red crayon behind their back. And you say to them, have you been drawing on the wall? And they say, no, mummy. Have you been eating those chocolate Easter eggs before Easter bunny comes? No, mummy. And their natural instinct is to deny because they don't want to be naughty girl or naughty boy. They don't want to be that. Because they know what they've done is wrong. They know they've let themselves down. But they're trying to learn where the boundaries are. Now at that point, the parent can do one of two things. They can say, you need to tell mummy the truth. I know there's a red crayon behind your back and you have chocolate all over your face. Now, and then we'll go down and I love that Kath and Kim, look at me, look at me, look at me. You know, we say to our kids, look at me. Because we know, we want them to know we're gonna hold their heart. We want them to look into us and say, this is not okay, mummy loves you, but it's 7.30 bed tonight. And, you know, we, we're going to have to work at getting that crayon off the wall. So you show them discipline is different to punishment. Discipline is love fueled. And again, I love that word. Sister Anne, Anne taught it to me, a disciple. Um, it's a Latin word. Discipline is a you know, derivative disciple. It means to follow love and light. When we are moving forwards in life and when we are progressing, we are following love and light because that love and light treats us with respect. When there's a confusion, when we get stuck in a sin, when we, when we miss the mark, when people are respectful, we will follow love and light. That's a discipline. When we're living backwards and, and you know, with dark shadow self behavior, when we are regressing, I remember, you know, Sister Anne said to me, you know, the word evil is just is just the word live spelt backwards. And when people, when there's evil behavior, people are living backwards. They don't know how to follow love and light. It's never been safe or no one's shown them. They haven't had a fairy godmother. They haven't had anybody show up and love them when they've been at their worst. A great movie, um, Susan Sarandon and Sean Penn, Dead Man Walking. Beautiful nun, an act of grace. You know, on death row, she helps him find forgiveness and, and, you know, beautiful acting by both of them. But it's all about, you know, um, the discipline of sitting with somebody when they're at their worst and you being your best self. Now, I've paid a therapist for years to sit there with me as I've been at my worst because, I, you know, I couldn't bear to face myself. And, you know, they were paid to um, disagree with me without disrespecting me because I didn't have any... You know, beautiful Barb, I met her in recovery groups, but she wasn't skilled with, she's very skilled with addiction and she's still in my life 25 years later, but she didn't have a skill set around sexual abuse and domestic violence. I had to work with a clinician for that. So getting back to denial and pride and being disconnected, that crown chakra, you know, the chakra systems, chakra is a, is a Sanskrit word that means Wheel of energy, energy in motion. There are many different translations and it's, it's all signified by color. The crown chakra sits at the crown of the head. And when you think of a king or, king or queen's crown, it's usually gold and it's usually uh, shaped that way to let the kind of, to capture the light, to funnel it into this beautiful chakra, which is the, ent the entry point of the divine. Um, and the divine for some people is a religious, you know, uh, you know, it's Jesus, it's Buddha, it's Allah. Um, for me, God, G-O-D, is a metaphor for great outdoors, Mother Nature, Father Time. And so when we're blocked, we're prideful. 
when we're blocked, when that crown chakra is blocked and we're prideful and in denial, we are, you know, we've disappeared up our own ass. Um, we, are, we are a law unto ourselves. We um, remain unteachable. And when, when we stay in that state for too long, we call it a rock bottom in recovery. You know, Mother Nature <laughs> will drop you on your ass. I had a fall. Pride cometh before the fall. I got stuck in my pride of I was going to do those 80 days and my body was just going to do it and I was going to keep working and blah, you know, just being, you know, just being bloody minded, pig headed, blocked there in that intellect, allowing, you know, being a tyrant, a dictator, ignoring my body, ignoring my heart. So the way you can use this as a meditative re uh, reflection, remember, meditation does not have to be something that you do cross-legged um, and chanting mantras, you know, transcendental meditation, open-eyed meditation. You can Google meditation. There are so many beautiful ways to do it. For the busy person, I personally, you know, spend an hour every morning journaling, meditating. There, But meditation is um, the practice of connecting to your heart. Now we can do that through many different portals and we can do it for as long or as little as we want to. You know, a, your, your personal, a good personal trainer will give you some quick little exercises you can do while you're standing at a checkout or, you know, or, um, you know, at home or, uh, you know, just a little 10, 15, 20 minute workout that you can do. With meditation and plugging your heart in, which is the same thing, when we're doing a pride workout, and I'd like to really encourage you to have a think about this, there are many ways that you can plug in and do a declutter, do a detox and just check in where you get stuck. So you could go through the seven chakras, have a think about where you get stuck in pride. And if you're not sure, ask somebody close to you to be very respectful as they, you know, as they explain to you where, where they notice. So for example, you might get stuck in... Um, being not letting energy in, which is obviously where I was. So I, my, my crown chakra got, I, I wouldn't let my son's advice come in um, or with intuition. So blocked with a connection to there is no power greater than mine. There is no wisdom greater than mine. You know, we can get blocked in that arrogance. So I was definitely blocked there. We can get blocked in intuition, which is um, we don't listen. So Intuition is basically inner tuition. We talk about that third eye. And if you think of your third eye being like a beautiful light, like a lighthouse, it needs to move 360 degrees. Some people use intuitive thinking, but only externally. So they only use intuitive thinking relating to intellectual data. So they go into their, their intellectual library where they've collated data, but they only go 180 degrees. They don't allow that light to turn 360 and go into their heart's library on what they've learned about jealousy, what they've learned about betrayal, what they've learned about impatience. They don't access that because they haven't learned anything. They've been blocked. So again, was I blocked with my intuitive library? Yes, I was. I needed some revision there. I wasn't looking at what I had learned. And probably because I'd never run, I didn't know if my body could run for 90 days or if that was a good thing or if I was doing too much. Because I, you know, I had, I, I can walk every morning and, and, and do it for six months in a row and my body doesn't present a bill. So I thought maybe I can run every morning. And it was, you know, six Ks every morning and the workload I had was too much. And I didn't, you don't know what you don't know. I learned that. So asking yourself there, do you get blocked in not listening to your heart? So crown chakra, get blocked in being a know-it-all. Intuitive chakra, getting blocked in listening to what your heart's trying to tell you. Then there's the throat chakra. Do you get blocked? And this is where I, I put that, um, the seven deadly, deadly sins of sloth. So this is greed. I'm greedy. I just want to be able to do everything my way. I'm looking outwards only. I want everything to go my way. I want more of that. So that's what they call avarice or greed. That one is connection. You know, and when that gets blocked, it's pride. When this get block, gets blocked, we get greedy about what he, wanting more, all of what we want. When this one gets blocked, I like to link the sloth one here. Now, this is about our communication. Do you get prideful uh, around um, speech? You know, do you get blocked in um, 
fight or flight communication. So aggressive, making them wrong. Submissive, shutting up and keeping the peace, but slowly building resentment. When this chakra is working clearly, we communicate with calm assertion. So we can get blocked in sloth. And that means being a lazy communicator. It's easy to get aggressive and it's easy to get submissive. That's the easy way to communicate. You know, aggression, I'm gonna shame you. Submission, I'm gonna shame myself and punish you for it later. So do you get blocked there? The next one is the heart chakra. And that's where we, we see jealousy show up. And do you get blocked there? I, you know, we hear all about, you know, just be kind, be kind, be kind. And again, so many people, it's just about it, you know, and they are incredibly kind. They're, they're what I would call helpaholics. They're all about giving to everybody else, but not kind to themselves. They sit in front of me and they start belittling, belittling themselves, calling themselves ridiculous, insane, crazy, psycho, whatever they call themselves. So they're unkind to themselves. And again, that 180 degree kindness where, you know, you're only giving it outwards, you're gonna end up martyring yourself and getting resentful because that output only will present a bill. Your body will present a bill. So again, you want that chakra working 360. You know, really, if you're only being kind to other people and you're being really punitive and you talk about yourself really, really disrespectfully, that might be where you get blocked. You know, you get, you know, you get prideful there. It's all about everybody else and I don't deserve any kind of kindness. The next one is the gut, the solar plexus. This is where gluttony shows up. So greed is actually wanting more. Gluttony is taking it in, you know, spending, drinking, drugging, eating, porn, you know, all that sort of stuff to just, and that's often where our teenager self sits, where they just want more, 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 more. Moving further down to the, to the genital area, which is where uh, we can get blocked in that lust, and that is... I want no sex in my life or I want lots of sex. I want no sexual attention in my life or I want it all. Um, and when we get blocked there, we block our creativity and our passion. And then the base one is at the coccyx, which is all about survival. It's all about financial security. And when we get blocked there, we get angry. And anger is that second stage in, in the grieving process as well. Anger is always about loss. We'll unpack that a little bit more, but I just want to get back to pride as we conclude. So how can you do a meditative practice where you do a, pl a pride clearing? Well, first of all, collect your data. Uh, where do you get most prideful? I get, I get prideful and blocked in all of those energy centers, you know, and that's why I got dropped on my ass. Homework, you know, I'm not going to forget this one in a hurry. Um, sometimes I get a big lesson a big lesson in the physical. Sometimes I can intercept it before it happens, but you know, Mother Nature's always upping my assignments. There's always more to learn. What I do suggest, you know, is to have a think about that. Now, for some people, they can go into a meditative place by journaling. There are lots of ways to do that by just quietly journaling and let your heart, um, I'm not talking about typing, I'm talking about handwriting. Just letting your heart have its say silently on the page. I've written six books. I didn't know I could write books. I wasn't, I didn't start journaling because I thought, oh, oh, I think I might write a book. I started journaling because it was my, it was a way of um, detoxing, letting my heart have a say. I wasn't brave enough to say any of that out loud. Oh my God, I don't know who's knocking at my door. Can you just hang on one sec? I'm just gonna pause. Sorry, I had to get up and answer the door. I'm really, um, I'm sorry that this is in two stages. I'm really shit at driving all this stuff, but we'll just continue on. I can't kind of remember where we were. Uh, yeah, about where you get second pride. Oh, that, I was talking about writing. So um, writing can be a meditative process. It's something you sit with in silence. You let your heart have its say. You let it just write and flow out. That's a meditative process. And I didn't really know my heart at all. I couldn't articulate. I couldn't speak to anybody. I wrote before I went to a therapist because I was, was not brave enough to actually let anybody know these deep, dark secrets. So writing... Uh, was very therapeutic. It was like putting a 20 cent piece underneath a piece of paper then getting a lead pencil and putting that on top. I got to see the imprint of what my heart needed to say. So a form of meditation around your pride, detoxing where you see yourself uh, or you feel that you get stuck in pride, write it out. Write it out to yourself. Give yourself the freedom to put it down on paper. Another form can be with colour and if you're, if you're artistically inclined, 
you know, sometimes um, drawing it out. And I've done many different forms of artwork around pride and getting stuck and just putting colors down on paper, images down on paper. If writing or drawings are not your thing, and they are meditative processes, you ask any artist. When they, are, they have charcoal, color, clay, whatever the medium they use in their hand, they are in a meditative place. Their heart is speaking. That is a form of meditation. Whatever your heart does as expressions of joy is, um, is rejuvenative. Your heart's battery recharges. So for some people every morning doing some journaling will work for them. For some people doing some artwork will work for them. Another beautiful thing is music, to lay on the floor. There's a beautiful song an artist called Sade sings, which is love is stronger than pride. To just lay and surrender to music. You know, um, another one, Pink Floyd, Comfortably Numb. To just lay there on the floor, and you know, if you've only got five minutes or 10 minutes, to pick a song where the artist speaks to you. And if you know you need to clear some pride, you know, a song that speaks to you about, you know, a time in your life where you have been arrogant, where you have been stuck. And there are many great artists that sing that shit out. Lay there and allow that artist to say, and allow yourself to go there, to feel it, to articulate and flush through. Now, laying and surrendering, absolutely being in a state of empowered surrender, you know, the horizontal position is that of divine feminine. When we are laying on our back and all our organs are exposed to the world, we are in a vulnerable place. And when we surrender through an empowered state, which means we volunteer surrender, when we, when we pray or meditate, we drop to our knees. But when we drop to our back, we are in a full state of surrender. And, and to invite that songstress or you know that artist to sing to you, it might just be Vivaldi, it might just be some beautiful music that makes your soul soar. Whatever the song is, if you know you've been blocked in, blocked in pride, you've been blinkered, allow, find yourself a song and allow yourself to lay there and surrender. Other things that um, can help you with pride uh, can be um, forms of, any form of receiving in a meditative space. For some couples, um, they haven't allowed anyone to touch them in a long time. Now, uh, it's not as if we can go and get a, a, a Reiki massage or any, anything like that at the moment, but if you are working on healing issues around pride and you're working with a partner, you know, perhaps just um, surrendering to giving each other a heart massage, uh, sorry, a, a, a hand massage before bed as you lay there to just surrender and allow them to you know, just rub some moisturizer into your hands or while you're sitting watching television, putting your feet on each other's laps and just allowing each other to receive. Because when we deny contact, when we deny connection and we get stuck in that blinkered state of pride, the heart remains on a very, very low battery. So there are many ways to the waterfall when it comes to reconnecting and clearing that block, that that blockage, that crown chakra um, with pride. One thing I would just encourage, you know, I hope some of this has been interesting for you or at least useful for you. There are some uh, little practices that you could practice there that just allow you to go into a place of connection and thinking about pride, having a conversation about pride. And again, not shaming yourself, making yourself worse than or better than anybody else. You can't change what you can't see. And when we're in denial and prideful, we can't see and hear a fucking thing. So surrendering, even just listening to, you know, this download around the topic of pride and acknowledging that, you know, you are a part of the human race. You do get prideful, you do get into denial. The people that give you the shits the most, like somebody on maths or, you know, somebody we see in full flight denial, we're not going to be able to be empathetic and compassionate towards another human being if you can't practice that towards yourself. Empathy is language of the heart. Empathy takes heart strength. It's easy to have sympathy. That is of the ego. That is of the intellect. We can have sympathy for somebody with a sore ankle or somebody who's had to bury a loved one because intellectually we get it. That makes sense to us why they are upset. 
But empathy is when you actually don't know the story behind their behaviour, but you care that they're in a state of distress, they're in a state of jealousy, they're in a state of pride, they're in a state of anger. That takes a lot of heart muscle to be empathetic and compassionate. That doesn't mean enable, it doesn't mean to say I agree with it, it means to be kind, to be open-hearted and open-minded. Now, a lot of us are are close-hearted. If we can't logically see why they are in denial, why they are lying, why they are jealous, why they are angry, angry, why they are lustful, why they are gluttonous, if we don't get it, we just make them wrong. And you're unteachable, you're being prideful in that state. But if we are open-hearted, empathy is when you don't understand the emotional drivers but you care that they're in distress. You have humanitarian concern because that person is in distress and they're not coping, they're catatonic, they're lying, they're being dysfunctional, they're disconnected, they're in denial, they're being prideful. Now, when we're in that place, what helps more than anything else is somebody talking to you with a kind heart, with kind words and a kind tone. But you can't give away what you haven't got. If you're not living it, you can only give it to other people for a certain period of time and then you drop out of range and then you get resentful and say, why am I there for everybody else but no one's there for me? The reason no one's there for you is because you ain't letting anybody in and most importantly, you're not letting yourself in. You are not showing up for yourself. Okay, so, so there's some things to think about there when it comes to the topic of pride, denial and connection. I hope some of that has been food for thought. I hope some of it's been useful. I'm sorry about that interruption. I had to cut this video into two. Um, but, you know, I will be back in the next episode that I'll try and do one every week to 10 days um, as soon as I can. But um, the next one we're going to have a look at is going to be greed. And we're going to be looking at in intuition um, and, and having a look at how um, we get stuck on you know, that external greed component and how we can look at some practices and unpack that a little bit. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, please just click on the little red tab. That'd be great to, you know, and if you do subscribe, bottle, you'll be the first to know that there is a new, I've downloaded the next one, episode two. Um, if you'd like to listen to any of my podcasts, you just type in emotional fitness recovery to iTunes or Spotify and my podcast will come up there. Thanks for spending time with me today and I look forward to seeing you again. Mwah! Lots of love, put my glasses on so I can see. Lots of love and I, um, I hope your pride detox goes well and I hope that if you're doing it in conjunction with the person that you're in isolation with, that um, yeah, that you both uh, are able to do an emotional upgrade and, and uh, be a little bit kinder and empathetic when Pride, denial and disconnection next show up. Okay, see you soon. Bye.